Thank you, and welcome to you, Admiral. It is really a special treat uh, for all of us to have you with us tonight. I think everybody in this room would say this was an awful, awful day. Um, just tragic day. So let's start off, Admiral. Help us understand what Putin's strategy is. Um, let's get above the battlefield for a moment and walk us through what his strategy is. What's his end game here? Well, first of all, let me confirm you can hear me in the audience. Can, can everyone hear you? Can. Okay, perfect. Right. Um, so thank you for having me. It's an honor to be with this uh, audience and with the, uh, the Monk Dialogues. Um, also, Whenever I'm with a Canadian audience, I like to simply begin by saying that many of your brave and professional troops served under my command in Afghanistan, and they were honorable, and I was honored to be their commander. Um, we could have a debate about how it turned out and why we went and a lot of other things, but as Canadians, you should, and I know you are, very proud of your military. Whenever I saw that maple leaf patch, I knew I was in the presence of a true hero. So thank you. Um, let's start with uh, Putin. Um, because I think to understand what's going on, you have to kind of go from the inside out. And what I mean by that is you need to begin with Vladimir Putin, the man, the biography. You need to understand his background. He is an angry, bitter, dead-ender who was a lieutenant colonel in the KGB during the Cold War, stationed in East Germany. The East Germans finally got their neck out from under the boot of the Russians. That annoyed him. He watched the collapse of the Soviet Union. That enraged him. And he has carried that bitterness, that anger, that truly, deeply, madly felt hatred in particular for my nation, for the United States of America, but also for NATO, for all of us, because he felt that was the, I'm quoting here, the greatest tragedy of the 20th century. Oh, really? A century in which we saw 80 million people killed in the First and Second World War, a Holocaust, too many atrocities to describe. But the worst thing that happened was the end of this evil empire. I don't think so. But that's his mindset. And he has spent his life clawing his way to the top of the greasy pole of Russia and to find himself in a position where he can, in his view, reconstitute what can be done of that shattered Soviet Union. So the movement on Ukraine is about that strategy, but in many ways, it's about Vladimir Putin solving his own demons. And you've seen this again and again. And as, as we all know, this isn't the first time or the second time we've seen this playbook. Arguably, it's the fifth time, if you kind of count Moldova and Kazakhstan most recently, but certainly 2008 in Georgia, 2014, first bite of the apple in Ukraine, and now, of course, the third time in Ukraine. So you start with Vladimir Putin, his insecurities, his needs. Number two, regional. He's trying to, again, reconstitute what he can of the former Soviet Union. Thank God, in my view, the nations of Eastern Europe, the Warsaw Pact, uh, sought to join NATO. And thank God we let them into NATO. Um, but a few were left out of the fold, including Ukraine. But he's also putting these pressures on Ukraine, on Moldova, on Georgia, on Armenia, uh, on Kazakhstan and the rest of Central Asia. So there's a regional audience and strategy at work. And, and third and finally, Janice, he seeks to impress and to strut on the global stage. And he is really playing in many ways to President Xi. And he wants to uh, create this idea in the mind of President Xi that Russia is the consummate partner for China. I think it's a flawed strategy. And at the end of the day, Vladimir Putin ought to be very careful what he asks for 
in terms of a partnership with China, because China looks north at Russia and sees Siberia, this vast, empty space full of gold, diamonds, water, rare earths, arable lands, oil and gas above all. China looks at that like my dog looks at a ribeye steak. It looks really good. And Putin's on his way to being the junior partner in that arrangement. That so is those a are kind very of the motivations at work here. That is this is a very very grim picture uh, that you are painting uh, of great power politics back with a vengeance and great power rivalry. And we're coming to China. Uh, because you wrote this thriller that I want to talk to you about. But before we go there, how far does Putin go now? Uh, what's the plan for Ukraine in this particular invasion that started yesterday? A good way to approach anything when you're dealing with an opponent is to stop and listen to what they're actually telling you. We put up with two to three months of dead lies. I'm not going to invade Ukraine. I have no territorial ambitions. This is all Western hysteria. NATO is whipping up these fears. The lying lasted for two to three months, kind of got through the Olympics. By the way, congratulations to your women's hockey team. Best. Got through Best. the Olympics. You knew I had to the say best. that. <laughs> through the Olympics in obeisance to President Xi. And then, and then the lies stopped and we saw the true Vladimir Putin over the last 72 hours. He gave two borderline deranged speeches, laid out a huge pattern of lies about the relationship between Ukraine and Russia and then invaded. And he has told us his objective. He is going to demilitarize Ukraine. That means kill many Ukrainian military, destroy their command and control, destroy all their aircraft, destroy all their tanks, destroy their ships, such as they are. He's going to defang Ukraine completely. Number two, he's going to affect a regime change. He's how going is that going to happen? And how, does that, how does that and capture unfold? or put on a show trial President Zelensky? And he is going to then put in a puppet government, think repeat of Yanukovych, who got run out of town on a rail in the Maidan in the Orange Revolution. There'll be a new Yanukovych. It might even be Yanukovych who will be the puppet. Putin will be the puppet master, and he will then seek to completely dominate Ukraine. I think it's a losing strategy, but clearly his objective is 100% control of Ukraine, probably through a puppet government. You know, for everybody in the room, President Yanukovych was the pro-Russian president that was expelled in 2014, which begins this latest version. Uh, Admiral, we have two students in the room from the Monk School who are from Ukraine. One from, they're here with us tonight, one is from Odessa. Um, one is from Kiev, and one of their families has already left for Poland. Talk to us about Ukraine's strategy. I saw empty highways this morning with no IDs on them. What's Ukraine's strategy? Is it to let the Russian army roll forward, pull back to the forests, and launch a campaign of resistance from the forests and the cities? Uh, step one will be to fight with what they have. And we have, we the West have put a, a moderate amount of weapons. I wish we had started earlier <clears throat> and brought more uh, capability to the Russian, to the Ukrainian armed forces to attack the Russians. But they will fight with what they have. And President Zelensky, I thought in a, in a superb speech, in contrast to the speech of Vladimir Putin, President Zelensky said, when you come for us, you will see our faces. We will fight you. You will not see our backs. And I think the Ukrainians will fight. They're tough. They are Slavic people. They have their own nationality, language. They have their own culture and history. 
Ukrainian soldiers fought under my command in Afghanistan, and they are brave and true-hearted. They will fight. However, the Russians have a great deal more technology, more combat power, and I think, unfortunately, there is a strong chance because overall, Ukraine will not have air superiority, and Russia will, and that is a key factor on a modern battlefield. I think the chances are the Ukrainian military will not succeed in fully resisting or turning back the Russians. Therefore, your point, Janice, what's next? I think the Zelensky government initially will go to Lviv in the far west of Ukraine, establish its seat of government there, hope that the distance between uh, the Russian advance and Lviv is in some ways sufficient for them to reconstitute their own armed forces and block Russia. The further Russia goes into Ukraine, the further west they are forced to go, the longer their supply lines come, the more vulnerable those are to insurgencies, the more they will be challenged, the longer those Russian troops are dragged away from their home bases, the harder it is to sustain that campaign. So I think the Zelensky government, if it has not already done so, will be moving to Lviv in the far west. And then if the Russians seek to come all the way to that border, I think they will then simply step across the border, the Zelensky government, into Poland. There are U.S. troops there. There are Polish troops there. Believe me, Vladimir Putin will not cross a NATO border in anger. It would be a massive military mistake. He's about to make a massive economic mistake. Crossing a NATO border in anger would bring the full military force of this alliance against him. So I think the Zelensky government will be well positioned, go to Lviv, and if they have to, simply come across the border, government in exile, the Poles will welcome that, the rest of the alliance will support it. And then, like Charles de Gaulle in the Second World War, you create kind of a free Ukraine government. Um, the West will fund the ambassadors, fund the embassies, fund the seat at the United Nations, um, will do everything to continue to support it. Um, and I think at that point, that's when Vladimir Putin's problems really begin. Um, Admiral, let me ask you about two other dimensions of this war before we talk about NATO. One, of course- Wait, is, is wine permitted at yes, a monk dialogue? Yes, <laughs> it totally is. It always improves the conversation. <laughs> Let's talk first about the war at sea. Um, the Ukrainian Navy, the Russian Navy, this is something that you know intimately. How will that play out? Um, what happens to the Russian capacity to export by sea? And then just briefly, cyber. How worried should all NATO members be, including Canada, that there will be retaliatory cyber attacks for the sanctions that we join? with other NATO members in announcing today? Yeah, these are very smart questions. Um, so much of the analysis is focused on the land war, and, and that's appropriate and understandable. There's a lot of, we'd say in my trade, flashbang going on ashore, but it's the electrons and it's the sea that I'm watching. Um, particularly on the sea, um, this is where Russia dominates completely. Um, the Ukrainian Navy, much of which was uh, already taken in 2014, has never seriously been reconstituted. NATO has the Turkish Navy, the Romanian Navy, the Bulgarian Navy, and the U.S. Navy often deploys to the Black Feet, as does the French Navy and the British Navy, among others. Um, so there is a significant NATO presence in and around, but a immediately around Ukraine in that uh, 10 to 50 kilometer range off the coast, those are Russian waters at this point. And frankly, this is a big part of Vladimir Putin's motivation because the Black Sea itself is full of hydrocarbons and is crucial in terms of Russian access to the Eastern Mediterranean. 
So watch for that Black Sea fleet of Russia to continue to dominate those waters to the south to blockade this uh, portion. Now, again, Ukraine can still continue to get logistics and supplies from the west through its western borders, but from the sea, not going to happen. And, and to your student there in Odessa, you're going to see a lot of Russian warship activity in those waters. Um, so that's a zone that, that Russia will be quite dominant in, and they will use it effectively to blockade Ukraine from the sea. And if the Russian offensive is slowed or stopped in central Ukraine, look for Russia to use an amphibious assault to put troops ashore behind the lines of the Ukrainians. Um, so unfortunately, that zone I would have to cede to Russia, and they have a lot of options to use it. Um, cyber. Here, I've been surprised. Um, the assault, as I mentioned, was kind of a textbook, take out the air control, create the refugee streams, uh, knock down the command and control, send the shock, the shock troops in. But what's missing thus far has been a cyber attack, particularly on the electric grid. Uh, this is something Putin has the capability to, to really switch off. He has not done that. I think he doesn't want to show that to the West, show that technical capability. We would learn a lot on our side of the cyber divide watching. And then secondly, it's a human rights violation, a pretty clear one. Uh, that I think uh, he is less likely to conduct unless he absolutely has to. Um, so cyber for the moment, the frame is frozen. You'll see some minor DDoS attacks, but Putin is holding those cyber cards back at the moment. Now, Janice, here's what's important. Once those sanctions go into effect, Putin will be consolidating control over Ukraine at this point, perhaps, we'll see. But let's assume for the moment that he is. Then the massive sanctions hit. He's out of the SWIFT system. He's out of the banking sector. He's, he's out of hydrocarbons. There are secondary sanctions imposed across the board by US, Canada, Europe, Japan, Australia. He is. He feels the walls closing in economically. That's the point when I think he will be very tempted to use cyber to conduct horizontal ex escalation. And where will those attacks go? I think um, Canada probably less so, simply because you're not, if you will, the face of the alliance. I think they will come to the United States, probably to the United Kingdom. Those would be the two sort of obvious targets, um, Britain because of its role within the continental NATO structure, United States for all the reasons we <laughs> normally end up as the target, um, sometimes uh, our fault, sometimes the fault of our opponents. And so uh, look for him to come at particularly UK and US. This is probably two to four weeks from now. And how will he do it? I think it is less likely that he will go after the financial sectors of, of UK, US, because they're very well defended. I think more likely he will go after um, consumer, food chain, uh, gasoline sales, maybe refineries. What he will want to do is make the Biden administration look weak and antagonize voters and try and create divisions here in the United States. So he'll go after popular uh, consumer food chain, things that impact Americans in very real and, and present ways. Um, again, I, I think it's unlikely he'll go directly at Canada, but as is so often the case, your nation tends to get scooped up um, due to behavior to your South I and, know what you're talking uh, about think, here. I think, I think we it's, all it's do. Worth, it's worth being concerned about. Yeah, and I, I think it would be fair to say this, Admiral. We have great hockey, 
We don't have great cyber defenses in this country. <laughs> uh, we need to up our game. Uh, so I, I'm not quite as sanguine as you are. And just by the way, um, Russia was not taken out of the SWIFT system today, which was a very, no. very strategic move by the Biden administration not to do that, even though major Russian banks uh, were cut off. I think that was really um, super smart on the part of the administration. There were many questions tonight at dinner, Admiral uh, Stavridis, about Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. There is a sense that um, Putin is unleashed. How worried are you about any kind of attack against the newer, smaller NATO members who joined um, in these last 20 years? I'm not worried. I do not think Vladimir Putin uh, would cross a NATO border in anger. And I'll tell you why. Uh, number one, we outspend him 10, maybe 15 to 1. The defense budget of NATO is north of 900 billion. His defense budget is about 60 billion. Um, we have three or four million men and women under arms, almost all of them volunteers. He has perhaps a million, uh, half of whom are conscripts. We have 50,000 combat aircraft. He has perhaps 20,000, probably less. We have 800 serious ocean-going warships. He has maybe 100. Um, I could go on and on. You get the idea. Um, we overmatch him significantly. And thus, I think highly unlikely he would decide to go after Estonia, Latvia, both of whom have uh, Russian-speaking minorities. And the thesis here is that you know, he he will attempt that in a sense that, you know, breaks them apart and pulls them away. I, I just don't see that happening, particularly as we've now had not one, but two and now three times watching this playbook. Um, I think we're now sufficiently sensitized that if he does make this play against Estonia, a small nation of a million people, highly cyber capable, um, we'll, we will see that one coming. Um, and I think, frankly, uh, on because he's done what he's done in Ukraine, I think it's much less likely he would attempt to take a bite out of the apple in Europe. Um, having said all that, I think there's possibilities for him to use cyber, to use unmarked troops, uh, to use campaigns of disinformation, much as he's done in the United States uh, and other European NATO allies, um, in order to you know, just create division, sow discord. I, I think all of this is counterproductive for Vladimir Putin. If I were advising Putin, which I assure you, I am. You don't not. want to do that. Right. You don't want to be in that room with him. We saw exactly. those pictures. But I, if I were, I would say not only what I say you're, you're really putting yourself at risk with China. The other thing I would be saying to Vladimir Putin is your future, the best future for Russia is, is to the West. It is to connect with Europe. And, and you're, you're blowing all that up uh, for no reason. He, he is a very clever tactician, but he's a bad strategist and he's going to leave Russia in a far worse position than that in which he took power. I think this was a huge strategic mistake um, on, on his part. I agree with you. Um, before we turn to your book, um, tell us what you think of the performance of the Biden administration. What grade do you give it? in the way that it has dealt with NATO members and G7 countries, right or wrong decision to take force off the table from day one? And what do you think of the sanctions regime? Um, I, I think that the Biden administration has done a commendable job dealing with this scenario. Um, I think they did a less commendable job in Afghanistan, and that's 
yet another long conversation. We, we don't have time to unpackage tonight. But as a fair grader, I would have to say, when the administration came out of the blocks, um, the Afghan series of decisions included some mistakes, both tactical and strategic. Break. I think on this, on Ukraine, I think they've done very well. Um, perhaps they could have got somewhat more uh, aid to Ukraine more quickly, but even there, they have pushed hundreds of millions of dollars, um, Stinger anti-air, Javelin anti-armor, tons of cyber, tons of uh, ammunition, small arms, heavy machine guns. We have put a lot in there, along with many of the NATO allies, by the way. Um, and so I think from a military position, they've done the best they could with the hand of cards they had. I think it is not feasible uh, to commit U.S. troops or NATO troops to a combat action in a nation that is not part of NATO. And that's simply a reality. And I think they recognized that early and did everything they possibly could. I particularly commend two things. One is the way they declassified intelligence yeah. and shined a light. You know, if, if there's a burglar approaching your house, the two best things you can do are turn on the lights in the house so everyone in the house can see what, what's going on, who's awake, what's happening in the house, how do we help each other, and even better, turn on the lights outside the house. Um, burglars don't like bright lights, and we took away a lot of the element of surprise. We took away a lot of the credibility, such as it was, of the Putin administration. We created a sense of being ahead of Putin on that, so I think that was tactically uh, different than anyone else has dealt with uh, Putin in a smart play. And the other thing I think they've done very well are these sanctions, which they have coordinated amongst all the allies, really amongst all the democracies, and I think are going to have real accountable influence on Vladimir Putin over time. Doesn't mean he's going to suddenly wake up on a Wednesday morning eight months from now and pull out of Ukraine, unrealistic. But he will feel the pain, and that needs to happen for the accountability of the international system. Overall, I'd give the president and his administration high marks on the Ukraine situation. It, and by the way, for you know, truth in advertising, I have been participating and advising, so I'm not a disinterested observer when I say that. That's a disclosure. I actually asked you what we call a setup question there. <laughs> I think they've done a great job, the administration. And in fact, this is the first time that the United States has crafted an information strategy for an information war. Uh, so what you saw was something very, very novel and I think very effective. A year from now, um, if there is, in fact, a pro-Russian government in Ukraine, will Russian forces be back in Russia? Uh, the vast majority will be, uh, but just as in Belarus to the north, which is a pretty good comparative, if you will, um, there will be times when Russian troops will be necessary to prop up what will undoubtedly be a rotten and corrupt regime. I'll tell you something else that I hope, if we're in that scenario a year from now, we won't have 30 nations in NATO. I hope we have 32, because I think Finland and Sweden are watching this closely. And frankly, it would take years or decades for Ukraine to get into NATO, even if Russia wasn't pushing against them. Same with Georgia, same with Armenia. It's a hard slog to get into NATO. I always say to my friends in Helsinki and Stockholm, tell us on a Wednesday you want to be in NATO, we'll have you in on Friday. They are that good. And both those nations deployed their soldiers, sailors, airmen, all fought under my command in Afghanistan, Libya, the Balkans, piracy, cyber, they are highly capable, and they have been neutral, you know, as part of their culture and DNA. I respect that. But 
I think now, as they watch what has just happened in Ukraine, I suspect a year from now, every possibility those two nations will have joined NATO. They would be welcome in the view of this former Supreme Allied Commander. Now, Admiral, speaking of who is watching, you and Elliot Ackerman wrote a gripping thriller, uh, the book that Rudyard talked about. I wouldn't recommend it for bedtime reading because it is the story of an accidental war that comes as a result of miscalculation between China and the United States. If you do read it before you go to bed, you bring your bottle of scotch with you, all right? <laughs> Otherwise, you are gonna have a very restless night. China, two questions. Um, again, coming from people at dinner, how likely is China, China is clearly watching this. What is China learning from the fact that Vladimir Putin walked in to his next door neighbor, overran them in a brutal use of force. What implications does this have for Taiwan? Well, first, some analysts have posited this idea that uh, because of what has just happened in Ukraine, we're gonna see China make uh, an immediate move on Taiwan. Um, I don't think so. Um, a couple of reasons mitigate against that. First of all, um, this year, President Xi wants a quiet year going into the 20th Party Congress at the end of this year, where he will be anointed to his third five-year term as the leader of China. This effectively will move him into the pantheon with uh, Mao and Deng. Um, and I think he's not looking for a, a, a lot of controversy between now and then. Secondly, China has had a very patient strategy with Taiwan. The Chinese generally are patient. Um, and I think that they are um, not going to have a precipitate move simply because the Russians do something. I think it almost would move in the opposite direction. As the Chinese look at Russia, there's nothing the Chinese hate more than, uh, than emotion-driven uh, kind of step out of the box, you know, in China, Messiness. it's all pretty measured. I, I, I don't see them, you know, following the lead of Vladimir Putin, let's put it that way. And then third, the Chinese are not yet confident that they can overmatch the United States. And they're not yet certain about whether or not the United States would fight on behalf of Taiwan. Um, we have pursued a strategy, as, as many in this audience will know, we, the United States, have followed a strategy of uh, strategic ambiguity in terms of Taiwan, meaning we neither say we will defend it, nor do we say we won't defend it. China, if you're a military planner, you have to assume we will defend it, because that's how military planning works. You plan against the worst case scenario. So for those three reasons, I don't see an immediate move against Taiwan. Now, how does all this appear to the Chinese? Um, they recognize the difference between a NATO member and a non-NATO member. What they can't figure out is, how do we think about Taiwan? And that's why I think this policy of strategic ambiguity, which some have criticized, I think is probably the right path forward. Um, when I boil it all down, I don't think what has just happened in Ukraine is going to have an energizing effect on uh, in an, an attack on Taiwan. I think that's five to 10 years out, may or may not come. A lot of different events could change that calculus going forward. Final question, um, and I know we have to let you go, and thank you so much for being so generous with your time. Uh, this is the biggest war that Europe has seen since 1945, and I don't think any European expected to see that uh, in their lifetime. Uh, China is um, a capable, technologically uh, excellent society that is learning at pace and learning at scale. That nice rules-based international liberal order, so beloved of Canadians, especially their leaders, 
that's probably gone. Um, what are the next 30 years? Or let me take you out to 2034. How does the United States manage two rivals, Russia and China, at the same time? Let me reframe the question very slightly, Janice, and say, um, is democracy declining in the face of authoritarianism? And I think the answer to that is, I'm going to bet on democracy here. And, and I'll give you several reasons for that. Uh, one is that despite its incredible messiness and difficulties and, and protests as you just went through in Ottawa with your truckers, and as we go through every five minutes in the United States with some crazy extremist group, you know, democracy's a mess. But I'm with Winston Churchill, uh, you know, a common forebearer to both of our nations, if you will. Um, Churchill said, democracy, it's the worst form of government, except for all the others. And, and I think what he meant by that is for all its messiness and inefficiency and difficulties, for all of that, it reflects human nature. People want voice. They want to participate. Not every single person wants to be the leader, but all of us want voice. And I think democracy reflects that in very fundamental ways. Uh, number two, the long throw of history so far is on the side of democracy. Um, exhibit A would be, you know, go back 120 years ago. How many democracies were there in the world? There were about 14, maybe 15. Today, depending on how you kind of score it, there are somewhere between 80 and 100. Um, democracy, as we unspool the last 150 years, is moving pretty quick, actually. And, and sometimes when I say that, people would say, oh, yeah, Admiral, but look at China. Look at, look at Russia. Well, OK, look at them. They've been authoritarian nations for millennia, both of them. There's nothing new there. What's new is the march of democracy, decolonization. Um, and yeah, you know, we'll have some good days and bad days. And today's a bad day for democracy, inarguably, a terrible day for democracy. But we will have good days. And again, I wouldn't bet against us. And third and final reason, look at the democracies in the world today. Um, your nation, my nation, the NATO nations, Japan, Australia, South Korea, India. Watch India. And sure, India is going through a moment or two of, you know, kind of difficulty with its democracy. And, and India is a big, fractious country. 800 million people, by the way, voted in the last election. I mean, think about that for a minute. 800 million people voted in a nation of, I don't know, 1.2 billion. Um, it's a pretty vibrant democracy. And at the end of the day, back to where you're going to place your bets, watch my hands. Over here, let's say the West, United States, Canada, NATO, Japan, Australia, Singapore, all of those techno democracies. Over here, the authoritarian world, China, Russia. Where's India? India's here. They're kind of in the middle. I'm going to bet, for a variety of reasons, India's going to end up over here. And if they do, and I think they will, that will be a determinative factor in this international system going forward as this century unfolds. That's part of the thematic in the book in 2034. And... I don't think India is actually going to have the capabilities we ascribe to them by 2034. It might be 2084 by the time they have that capability, that kind of throw weight. But the reason they appear in the story in that fashion is because so often they're this invisible country. We spend all our time talking about NATO and the EU and the United States and 
the West and China and Russia. We never talk about India. Yet India is this nation of 1.2 billion. By the middle of this decade, they'll overtake China. They're a democracy, a very vibrant one in my view. And they've got a lot of bad road ahead of them, but their demographics are powerful. And demographics can be destiny for nations. And they're a democracy. So that it's is... a long way of saying, Janice, um, I, for all the risks and for the difficulty of this day, which I'll remember a long time in terms of where democracies go, don't bet against us. That is a great note um, of inspiration, frankly, Admiral Severus, to end on. So everyone join me in thanking. We pulled him away. Thank you. My pleasure.